Cheers, guys. Welcome to episode 18 of the VR show. I'm your host, Epix, and uh, what a show tonight. In the VR chat segment, I want to talk about the amazing side benefits to VR technology. We get so caught up in the gaming aspects, we sometimes forget what VR brings up along with it in terms of parallel emerging technology, in terms of improvements to existing tech. That in the VR chat segment. We're also going to look at the latest, greatest, and maybe not so great titles available for VR in the month of December. The PC side of things, a massive list. We'll touch on that. Borderlands 2 VR, which I will have a quick look up within the couple of days for. And of course, the VR Roundup segment, where we take a look at all the latest and greatest VR news in and around the world of VR, all platforms. Before we do that, guys, just a reminder of the timestamps in the description for anything in this program, any story within a segment, you can jump right into it. Still uh, doing a guest hosting stint over at PSVR Frank. Those of you who've come over uh, to support, much appreciated, guys. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. So if you're looking for just PlayStation VR, of course, touch on that here. But it's also over there, distilled down to literally just that. And with that said, guys, uh, grab a snack bevy of choice, sit back. Let's take a look at this week's VR Roundup. Here's an interesting one. The developers behind Richie's Plank Experience took to Reddit this week. Looks like in the light of uh, the reviews which they've been getting outside of Steam, which have not been favorable at all, saying that if your expectations don't gel with what it actually is, to not buy the game. They then go on to say that it's a party game and meant as an introduction to VR. And the first question I got to ask, and yes, I did a video on this way back when, is why the steep price? Probably should, and I say this of course with the power of hindsight, have been priced at less than $5 US. If there were ever a $4.99 title, this would be it. Palmer Lucky started out as a bit of a hardware hacker slash modder of virtual reality tech. So not really a surprise that he'd go back to exactly that post his Facebook purging. On his blog, he mentions an Oculus Go project. He's calling Oculus Go Black, wherein he has shuffled, reduced, and altered a few things to provide, as he puts it, a huge step up in terms of overall experience. The changes as follows. He's dyed it via a boiling pot, and I'm not kidding here, you can see it via the link in the description below, a pot of black polyester dye. He's reduced the weight from 400 to 280 grams by relocating the battery and replacing the stock passive cooling with a custom one that's both lighter and more efficient at the same time. He's also removed the 2600 milliamp battery with a 3500 milliamp one. That one now located via a small tethered cable at the back of the headset strap in a Velcro sheath. This not only balances it, he feels it's subjective, but about 50% better feeling weight-wise. It also improves the lifespan of the unit by about an hour. So instead of two, expect to get three with this mod. Still on the battery side of things, he's also added a power cable with a magnetic pogo pin connector so end users can hot swap the battery. If you're not familiar with that term, essentially means swap it while you're in a game or experience without getting dumped out. Very cool. This next story really should come as no surprise. The attrition continuing for IMAX. IMAX releasing a statement that reads as follows. With the launch of the IMAX VR Center pilot program, our intention was to test a variety of different concepts and locations to determine which approaches work well. After a trial period with VR centers and multiplexes, we have decided to conclude the IMAX VR Center pilot program and close the remaining three locations in Q1 of 2019. As with the other week, I won't let them off the hook that easy. If you're gonna do a pilot test with a set scope, then adhere to that original scope. You placed a bunch of HTC Vives in a few locations. You essentially recreated the home experience for users when your original scope was to provide an experience via StarVR spec 
head-mounted displays that provided experiences that mirrored the adjoining theaters in that they could not be recreated at home. So you can make it sound as matter-of-fact as you want, but your whole project was flawed from the get-go and essentially has proved nothing. Well, it proved one thing. Whoever did the initial project scope didn't ensure it was followed. This next story feeds right into today's VR chat segment. Researchers from Cambridge in UK and Jilin in China published a joint paper in Nature describing their work in red OLED subpixels. Knowledge of quantum physics would obviously help uh, us throw some attaboys their way, but here goes the official explanation. The technique involves using radicals, semiconducting molecules with unpaired electrons. According to the paper, a quantum physics property of these radicals causes them to form an electronic state which allows them to avoid a typical quantum mechanical limitation which previously limited OLED efficiency. The result is near-perfect efficiency. In English, battery lasts longer because red pixels more efficient. There you go. The technique, though, apparently won't work for blue pixels, so additional research to further improve efficiency for those is required. But hey, a cool first step. While it's not usually anyone's uh, first go-to for games and sales, Viveport, if you're an owner of an Oculus Rift or an HTC Vive, uh, has their winter sale going on right now. You got a lot of stuff between 10 and 40% off. A couple of standout titles there, Prison Boss, $15 down from 20. Moss, $22.50 US down from 30. You've also got Ultra Wings, $7.50 US down from 15 and a bunch more you can check out via the link in the description and finally parent company Zenimax subsid Bethesda Facebook and subsid Oculus settling out of court uh, in their long-standing dispute this thing's dragged on for a couple of years which is actually pretty short for this type of thing agreeing to put matters behind them, both parties, for undisclosed sums and undisclosed details, but at least the darn thing is put to rest. We can move on. Now. Right now. Let's start the VRXP segment off with Borderlands 2 VR, that title finally launching a few days ago, and the reviews have been everything from the abysmal 3 out of 10, I'm looking at you IGN, to, well, we can discuss that when I do my quick look on Borderlands 2 VR within the next couple of days. I'm personally not going to penalize it for things that I knew and that they were honest about from day one, like a DLC, multiplayer, and co-op. However, things like strafing issues yeah, those I will. So more on that when I do that video. In the meantime, guys, what are your thoughts on Borderlands 2 VR? Are you enjoying it or not so much? Let me know in the comments below. I've made no secret of the fact that Elite Dangerous is one of my favorite VR games of all time. In fact, it is still in my top five as of recording this. Well, Elite Dangerous releasing Chapter 4 3.3 if you want a full reading and accounting of the patch notes I've included the link in the description below but this brings with it uh, to close the season and just a metric crap ton of updates bug fixes and yes features now this year not as aggressive as previous years, but it still brought with it a lot of really cool features, some really damn nice ships, improvements to co-op and multiplayer within the game, and at the end of it all, is it still the grind fest it always was? Absolutely, and honestly, that's one of the things that I love about it. It's a title I can slip my headset on into and just kind of lose myself for a few hours doing whatever the hell I feel like. It's a really nice break from reality, but I've always been a little bit strange. For those of you who share that Elite's, you know, obsession with me, you might want to check out this update if you haven't been in game for a while. It brings a lot of stuff with it. 
This next title, we've seen it elsewhere. It's finally made its way to PlayStation VR, Roller Coaster Tycoon Joyride. Those of us who got to try this on Rift and Vive uh, and who have PlayStation VRs, or if that's your only platform, the game available for $30 US. Unfortunately, you can't do the design and build phases of the title with your VR, but the riding testing of tracks afterwards, absolutely full on virtual reality. So if that's a title uh, you're thinking of getting. Uh, you know, I haven't done too much with that title in the past. Uh, let me know, convince me this is something I wanna try uh, or not. Thanks. I did some research for this uh, title over on PlayStation VR, Frank. It's called Falcon Age, and uh, I like this enough. Uh, I want to talk about it here. It's uh, from developer Outer Loop, and we didn't know a lot other than it was a falcon hunting title. But their newest trailer shows a little bit more. It shows you raising the hawk from infancy to adulthood. And aside from training, it shows hunting, but it also shows a crafting component. And it's very much kind of reminiscent of the Dragon Quest VIII style crafting where you throw stuff into a pot and hit the mix button. And then there's also a combat element where you and the Falcon are engaged in combat against droids. Now, kind of looks a little bit of that, uh, you know, Zero Dawn flavor, but uh, I'll let you judge that yourselves. Either way, Falcon Age, available sometime in 2019 for PlayStation VR. Upload VR has a pretty cool article about all the various games for VR games coming out for the Rift 5 and Windows VR platforms for December 2018. So many titles, in fact, I can't possibly cover them all here. Instead, let me scroll through the list with you so you can see where the titles uh, are, what they're called, how much they're going for, and do a bit more additional research. I'll do the same, and I'll try to whittle this list down uh, next week during the next episode of VR Show. Blade and Sorcery, a title we talked about many, many months ago, available for early access on both Rift and Vive via Steam. So this title was released uh, just a day after I uploaded the last VR show. If you're somebody who's easily offended by game violence, uh, albeit cartoony violence, you might want to give this one a pass. Not a lot of peaceful stuff going on this game. There is certainly no picking of the daffodils, no gathering of acorns, no harvesting of the autumn melon, or kicking the inflatable ball on the sandy beaches of your youth. No, the fair in this title, a little bit more visceral, a little more in your face or their face. Let's just say peace, not the pastime that is front and center in this title. Of course, again, it is early access, so it will be rough. It will be unfinished. Uh, the idea being there is a promise of hopefully a future completion date. Anytime you enter into early access, though, you run that gamble. Do you uh, believe the devs? Do you take your chances? That's up to you, but if what you've seen on the screen is your fare, Blade and Sorcery available now via Early Access. All right, VR chat segment. Wanna talk about technology that VR brings up around it. One of the, I guess most amazing things, and it's horrible in one sense, but amazing in the other, is that even during our darkest periods, the darkest periods of humanity, out of that comes some good. Comes some bad as well, but some good. Take a look at World War II, what it did for rocketry that eventually we used for space travel, for satellites, for developing technologies that we now take for granted. Cellular phones, uh, GPS positioning, so much came out of that, which came out of, like I said, something kind of dark and horrible. You could look at the arms race itself that continued throughout the Cold War. Some of the most powerful weapons ever built by humanity helped really, at least on a global level, sue for peace, didn't end conflict, 
but it did in a way at a global scale. Some technologies stick around a hell of a long time. Take the cathode ray tube, the good old CRTV, CRT TV. I grew up with that. I would not have envisioned a day it didn't exist because it simply had been around so long, decades before I was born, late 40s, decades after I was born, this thing just persisted. Eventually, though, even the CRT gave way to LCD, OLED, plasmas, etc., and so much of what we have available now. Those big screens back then, anything over 20 inch, if you had a CRT TV, you know what I mean, those things were a bugger to move. That, if anything, was probably the biggest thing preventing, uh, other than the technology itself, of course, was the weight preventing the big screen TVs. And yet they did make them, you just needed an army to move them. Take the audio, the music industry, records, 8-track, which was a bit of an evolutionary dead end, but gave way to cassettes and CDs and the MP3s and everything that we have now. Enter virtual reality. Saw that article, and some of you might have seen, it's not an article, a, a video, a, a draft, draught. I'm not even going to give him the time of day by pronouncing his name right, but the typical VR is dying video. And uh, this schmuck pretty much did zero research and just basically passed on things he'd gotten secondhand that honestly a little bit of fact checking would have went a long way into ensuring it was vetted properly. It wasn't. But um, that video kind of spurred this on. So what has VR brought along with it? Well, one of the examples I love to give, it's a quote, and I've used this in the past. Anyone who's watched the channel for a while, and yeah, I still don't know who to attribute it to. I think it's Isaac Asimov, but it goes like this. Future advances will come in those areas that we today are not wise enough to predict. And how true is that? Take a look at the 1950s version of the future. It was a version of the future firmly entrenched in the 1950s of the day. Fallout 4 plays on that brilliantly. Take a look at the 1980s version of the future in a movie like Back to the Future. It had fun with the 80s for the 1950s, but at the same time, when it was asked to look at, you know, the 20 teens, for example, it got them horribly wrong. Some things sort of bang on, others just were way more advanced than what was portrayed in the movie, and in other ways, were a little more backward. But it didn't stop the predictions, but perfect examples of that. Going back to the 1980s real quick, let's look at Stephen Hawking, okay? Here's somebody who had ALS, uh, a crippling, you know, motor neuron disease, confined him to a wheelchair, but did not confine him to a life of isolation. In fact, he was able to rise above ALS thanks to technology. Almost to a point where it kind of got ridiculous. He got so attached, for example, to the 1980s voice synthesis program that he was using that he pretty much stayed with a version of that right to the end of his days when stuff existed, but he said, no, people have gotten used to me sounding like that. That's my voice. And in fact, it did become synonymous with him. Anytime you heard 1980s speech synthesis, his was the name that first usually popped up to mind. Let's take a look at foveated rendering and eye tracking specifically and what that will do for tomorrow's Stephen Hawking's help, today's Stephen Hawking's. Eye tracking technology was always being worked on, but never at the feverish pace as now with VR pushing it even harder. Eye tracking is going to get to the point where people are going to be able to communicate, thanks to eye tracking, on a visual layout as effortlessly, as fast, as efficient as you or I using our conventional speech. That is amazing. The rendering portion over great distances, things like remote probes, Mars, Kuiper Belt objects. In the future, we are going to be 
right there with those probes, experience everything, albeit at a delayed signal, but we will be there and it is gonna be brilliant. Tomorrow's Juno probe, we're getting fantastic shots, you know, motion videos even of the Jovian cloud cover, how those almost perpetual storms kind of cycle and look, but through probes that are gonna be able to deliver that in ways we can't even imagine. It's going to be freaking unreal. And it almost drives the point home that maybe our remote technology, thanks to stuff like VR, is going to get so good, we really don't need to be on those ships. Nothing beats, you know, having a human present for some of that exploration. But unless it's safe to do so, we're probably going to be able to do so much science remotely, it'll almost, you know, mean a human doesn't need to be on board. That is awesome. Take the surgeon looking at a tumor in a way he's never been able or she to look at a tumor before. In not just 3D, but as if the tumor were an entity the size of a watermelon sitting right in front of that surgeon. That is what VR technology and augmented reality tech is bringing to surgeons everywhere. They are not going to pull the plug on that and say, you know what, this VR thing is passe, it's dying, put it away. We get so caught up in the gaming aspect of it and the dribble coming from authors like Dribble Guy there with his dribble, we forget how much else is benefiting from VR? Sure, gaming maybe is moving at a bit of a slower pace than you or I would have liked, but it's moving forward. And all this other stuff is moving forward along with it, and it's going nowhere. Think about that. The next time somebody talks foveated rendering, which I'll get to real quick in a sec, the eye tracking aspects, all of that, where its genesis kind of began in terms of accelerated research. And a lot of that in the future, people are going to look back and they are going to say VR improved that. VR made that research more effective, more efficient, uh, more of a mainstream thing for other researchers and developers to latch on to, right? A lot of that tech is shared. Some of it's behind closed doors being worked on right now. We don't know what it is until it gets released, but a lot of it is out in the open. It's being partnered with other companies. There's a camaraderie there and some of that stuff just so absolutely beneficial. Talked about training programs. Not going to beat all of those to death. We've talked about them. We know what they are. But all of that is not just suddenly going to stop. It's going to continue to improve and it's going to become so synonymous with everyday reality, it'll be hard to remember a time when it didn't exist. Just like it is when you try to remember a time before texting, right? I lived a huge chunk of my life prior to texting. I got to experience it firsthand with pagers. That was pretty horrible. But I remember what it was like pre and yet here we are and I can't imagine how I ever got around without that easy form of communication where every little thing I had to research I had to do at a library via books because the internet didn't exist in the shape and format that we're now used to it existing. It did but it was all behind closed doors still at the university level. Probably missing some things, that's fine. Let me know in the description, uh, in the comments below, guys, uh, some other benefits to VR tech that just make this technology unstoppable. And that's what it is. No one dribble author is going to stop it with a crappy, crappily written article. That's not enough to derail VR. Sure, he might hype up a few, you know, bystanders that don't know better on the sidelines, but that's it. We keep marching forward. Guys, that's it for this episode. Uh, yeah, I know, a little passionate on that one, but that's how I feel. Let me know your thoughts. If you like this video, hit that like button. If you haven't yet and you've hung around a few videos, 
hit that subscribe button. Love to have you on board. Have a fantastic week, guys. And as I always say, cheers.